create a medic here at the University of Birmingham and a presenter at the Aspiring Medics. Today we're going to go through 10 key current affair questions and if you haven't done so already, please do like the video and comment down below. Station 1. How can medical schools and the NHS collaborate to address the radiologist shortage? So radiology is a branch of medicine that looks at CT scans, MRIs, x-rays in order to diagnose a disease or to help diagnose a disease. And currently in the UK we're seeing a shortage in our specialist doctors who are radiologists. And there are lots of things that medical schools and the NHS uh, can be doing in order to increase the number of radiologists that we have. And these involve things like increasing training posts, encouraging specialisation and promoting radiology at the global level. In terms of expanding training posts, we can increase the number of training posts we have at, after post-graduation. So at the minute, it's very competitive to get into radi radiology after having done your F1 and F2 years. So we can mitigate this by increasing the number of training posts we have. Additionally, we can also integrate more thorough training around radiology throughout the medical education. So we can do this by increasing placements and, th and then this can go on to increasing um, the interest students have into pursuing this field further down the line. We can also increase um, the number of radiologists we have by um, encouraging specialisation and we can do this by creating incentives uh, for pursuing this particular field. This may mean we add in additional fully funded um, years within the training programme where people can go into research and things like that. Additionally, we can also incorporate um, AI modules within the training programme which can attract very tech savvy medical students as well. And finally, we can promote um, radiology at the global level and this means that uh, we'll be attracting radiologists from different different countries and then this can go on to increasing the number of radiologists we have in our country. So overall there, is, there are many things that medical schools and the NHS could be doing in order to address this. Station 2. How can healthcare professionals integrate nature-based activities into mental health treatments? So nature-based activities are on the rise as being very significant in aiding people's mental health. I know for one that when I do spend time outside or in the sunshine, it greatly benefits my mood. There are lots of things that healthcare professionals can be doing to integrate this into a patient's mental health treatment plan. They can offer green prescriptions, they can um, refer patients to community programs and offer ecotherapy sessions as well. In terms of green prescriptions, doctors can actually prescribe or healthcare professionals can, can prescribe patients to spend more time outside or do walking or running outside or even just simply being in the sunshine um, as a way to help tackle their mental health issues as well. Additionally, healthcare professionals can also refer patients to community programs and these programs can be things like um, group park runs, group park yoga, group park me me uh, meditation and I saw a really good example of this at my work experience at the GP surgery where I saw the GP that I was um, shadowing actually give the details of the person in charge of the um, group meditation at the local park to the patient and I thought that this was very insightful, very kind of them but I also think it increased the likelihood of the patient actually attending this um, program as well. And finally, healthcare professionals can also provide ecotherapy sessions. And these are essentially therapy th sessions that are happening outside in the outdoors to aid stress relief. And these can be things like gardening therapy sessions, which is a great hands-on activity to reduce stress. So overall, there are a lot of things that healthcare professionals can be doing to integrate um, outdoor activities or green activities into a patient's mental health care treatment plan. Um, so this is a very good way to treat the patient holistically. Station three. How can healthcare providers address body image concerns while promoting healthy self-esteem amid Zoom dysmorphia? So Zoom dysmorphia refers to the rising self-image issues we're seeing during virtual appearances and this can particularly affect patients, particularly now after the COVID-19 pan pandemic where a lot of consultations are still virtual. There are a lot of things that healthcare providers can be doing such as encouraging um, self-acceptance, -accept promoting a real life face-to-face uh, -face connections and also providing them with the right resources. In terms of promoting healthy body image, um, doctors can or healthcare providers can promote um, healthy body image campaigns. They can encourage self-compassion uh, with patients by, for example, eliciting um, these kind of issues very well during history taking. And this may mean having a very open and um, compassionate conversation with the patient and really addressing uh, any issues that may be there. Additionally, healthcare providers can also uh, encourage more face-to-face -face, um, interactions. So 
so recommending that patients uh, engage in more face-to-face -face activities with people which can actually take the pressure off when they are um, in virtual appearances for example. And finally, if there are any significant concerns around a patient's um, body image issues then doctors can provide them with the right resources such as referring them to counselling and mental health so referring them to counselling and mental health services when needed. So overall there are a lot of things that healthcare providers can be doing to encourage self-acceptance and tackle um, Zoom dysmorphia. Station 4. How can the NHS encourage patients to seek medical help sooner, especially in affected patient groups? Many patients actually delay in the healthcare that they need and this can lead to worsened health outcomes since they end up with more complications which end up being a lot more difficult to treat. And there are a lot of things that the NHS can be doing in order to address this. They can target vulnerable groups, they can engage in community outreach, they can leverage digital tools, um, they can address these barriers and finally improve trust that patients have in the NHS. So in terms of targeting vulnerable groups, we know for a fact that the social determinants of health really affect a patient's um, healthcare. So things such as being from a um, lower socioeconomic background, being poorly educated, can all determine um, how good your health is. So by targeting people who come from these particular groups, we can improve in them uh, in the time that they take to seek medical health, to seek medical care. Additionally, we can also leverage digital health tools such as the NHS app and make it more accessible to everyone. And through the NHS app, patients can track the kind of medications that they're on, they can track uh, and see any alerts that doctors might give them, and also book cancel appointments, which again makes healthcare very accessible, meaning that um, they're more likely to seek um, help sooner for their conditions. Additionally, we can also engage in community outreach by promoting campaigns that, um, for example, um, hi highlight the importance of early prevention, such as vaccination campaigns or screening campaigns. Furthermore, we can also address certain barriers that prevent people from uh, seeking healthcare sooner, such as the very long um, a &E waiting times, um, the difficulties in getting GP appointments, and we can do this by increasing funding into these particular services. And finally, we can also increase the trust that patients have within the NHS. And this can be by being very transparent when the NHS does make mistakes. And as we know, improving trust leads to better patient outcomes. So overall, there are a lot of things that the NHS can do in order to um, target these vulnerable groups and make sure that they seek healthcare sooner. Station five, what are the benefits and limitations of virtual learning in medical education, especially regarding clinical skills? So virtual learning definitely grew over the pandemic and it does come with a lot of benefits and a lot of limitations. So the main benefits to do with virtual learning is that it's very accessible um, and it's very convenient and how it also limits practical experience, which we know is paramount in medical education. Virtual learning makes online resources such as recorded lectures and recorded seminars very accessible. This means that um, learning is very flexible and students can access these resources when they can in their own free time. Additionally, it also makes learning very convenient for students who are commuting, for example, or students who are ill or who have other commitments. They can go back and watch pre-recorded lectures um, on demand. And after having spoken to a few friends who are at medical school right now, they have told me that they refer back to their pre-recorded pre-clinical lectures a lot now that they're in their clinical years and it definitely uh, benefits them knowing that they're there for them pre-recorded. Additionally, virtual learning revolving around virtual simulations can also be very beneficial since it means that students uh, have virtually done some kind of training before they enter the wards, meaning that they're a bit more confident before they step out into doing clinical skills in real life. However, this does come with limitations. Um, we know that with virtual learning, it can't replace in real life learning that's needed to learn clinical skills. Um, so on the whole, virtual learning does um, decrease the hands-on activities that you can do. Additionally, it also means that there's less interaction, particularly with your peers. And we know that um, in group situations or where you have projects where you need to work in as a team, this isn't the best case scenario. Um, teamwork is a very important skill that you need in medicine or in, uh, or in healthcare in general. And this, is, and this can be limited if you're just working on a project online via Zoom meetings. So on the whole, although virtual learning does come with um, increased accessibility, it makes things a lot more convenient. It needs to be balanced with the hands-on approach that you do need um, in medical school when learning about clinical skills or learning how to do clinical skills. Station six. How can the NHS improve the representation of diverse populations in clinical trials? 
So diverse representation for clinical trial means that the research that we end up with is more inclusive and therefore more reliable. And there are a lot of things that we can be doing um, in order to make sure that our research is very representative. And this means um, recruiting um, target recruiting from target populations, engaging in community outreach, being very flexible with our programs, and finally being transparent with our data usage. We can make sure that our recruitment is very targeted by making sure that we have particular numbers of people from specific um, socioeconomic backgrounds or from particular ethnic groups. And we can do this by engaging in community outreach where we're partnering up with local groups, local leaders to increase awareness of our trials and thus um, increasing the, the increase the participation for these trials as well. Additionally, we can be very flexible with our programs. And this means that we offer virtual check-ins um, and work the clinical trials around the schedules of the individuals involved so that we're meeting all the different people's different needs. And finally, we can be very transparent with our data. So once the clinical trials are over, we can share what we've learned with the participants um, and this can build trust with them, leading to further future participation for uh, programs as well. So overall, it's very important that we diversify our clinical trials so that they're representative and we can gather data from everyone to make any clinical outcomes um, more reliable and, and, and more representative. Station 7. What role do ethics committees play in balancing patient rights with resource availability? So ethics committees within hospitals actually help healthcare professionals navigate these tough decisions when it comes to patients needing particular procedures um, with the resources that we have. And they navigate things um, uh, to do with fairness, um, with prioritising care, and also, um, and also with uh, policy guidance as well. In terms of fairness, ethics committees apply um, frameworks like ethical frameworks um, when balancing um, patient needs with the amount of resources that we have. So when I was on work experience on the wards, um, there was a particular patient that needed an urgent organ transplant. However, they had a history of not adhering to medical advice, um, advice before procedures, and therefore um, it was a with the ethics committee and other healthcare professionals, they came to um, a conclusion that meant that the patient didn't receive that um, organ transplant since it, it wouldn't have been successful in their particular case. That being said, ethics committees also play a very important part in um, engaging with different stakeholders um, by making sure the patient's needs, the, their family's needs, the doctor's um, ideas, perspectives are all taken into account when coming up with a decision. So with the case that I saw with the organ transplant, it was a very difficult decision to make. However, um, the ethics committee made sure that they discussed this with all the different people involved um, in that particular case. Additionally, ethics committees also prioritise care by balancing um, the resource that we the resources that we have um, with the welfare of the patient. So in the again in the organ transplant case, um, although the patient didn't receive the life-saving organ transplant they needed, um, the organ transplant went to another person who for which the transplant would have been more successful since they adhered to adhered to advice or their background meant that they would have adhered to advice and it would have been a more successful procedure. Again, uh, meaning, meaning that our resources were used fairly. So overall, ethics committees have a very important role in actually making these um, very difficult decisions or helping making these difficult decisions um, since they really have to balance the resources that we have or the limited resources that we have like limited organ organs um, with um, patient welfare. Station 8. How might patients with healthcare related anxiety be affected by medical information on social media? So medical content on social media does benefit some patients since they're more aware of what's going on with their particular conditions or what the current healthcare news is. However, it can have a negative effect where they um, have more anxiety about any particular diseases that they have or they might have. The main ways that most patients can be affected by this is that um, misinformation regarding particular diseases can increase their anxiety, uh, increase their anxiety leading to worsened um, healthcare behaviours or in fact make them more ill with the behaviours and the things that um, they end up taking. What we mean by misinformation is that patients might misinterpret uh, any information that they do see online about diseases, about medications, or they might actually be misinformed by uh, non-credible resources uh, circulating on social media. Heightened exposure to these unreliable resources uh, can increase their anxiety, um, increase their stress levels, and we 
particularly saw this during the COVID-19 pandemic where there were a lot of false stories regarding um, the COVID-19 uh, vaccinations that were circulating. And this means that um, patients are more likely to spread it to other people um, and with this they can uh, engage in unhealthy behaviours by taking taking alternative medications or engaging in alternative um, you know, healthcare procedures which can worsen their outcomes um, and lead to poorer health. However, there are a lot of ways that we can tackle this and doctors, for example, can engage in very open communication um, when patients do walk in with any particular ideas or concerns about a disease that they have, um, doctors can um, relay the right information to them or guide them to the right resources like the NHS website which has credible information or the right information about um, all diseases that a patient may present with. And finally, healthcare professionals like doctors can also encourage self-care when it comes to healthcare related anxiety uh, by recommending um, limiting exposure to social media where they do see um, this false content circulating. So overall, um, there are a lot of ways that misinformation or um, non-credible resources can affect a patient's health, uh, to do a patient's health. Um, it can lead to increased um, anxiety levels surrounding their condition. Um, but there are ways that healthcare professionals can tackle this um, problem by promoting self-care, um, but also by providing them with the right resources when they are worried about something. Station nine. How might the NHS be impacted by plans to reduce police involvement in mental health calls? So reducing the involvement of the police in mental health emergencies can add to the pressure um, that the NHS already has. So currently in the UK, the police are heavily involved in mental health calls. They're usually the first line respondents when there is an immediate risk to a patient in a mental health crisis. Um, they're, also, they're also involved in welfare checks and they can also detain patients under the Mental Health Care Act. The main problems we'd see if we were to remove police from uh, mental health calls is that we'd see an increased demand on the NHS. We'd see um, um, longer response times and finally we'd have to use more resources. So if we were to remove uh, the police involvement um, from mental health court we'd see an increased demand on the mental health care services that the NHS already provides. We'd also see longer response um, times to these health mental health calls since it's usually the police who are first line respondents to these uh, mental health calls. And finally, more resources would be spent on training current mental health care staff on how to tackle and deal with these uh, mental health crises um, effectively. So overall, police have a very important role in dealing with mental health calls and if we were to remove them from the equation, there would be a very negative impact on the NHS. We'd have to allocate more resources to train staff and it'd take a lot longer to respond respond to these mental health crises, leading to poorer healthcare outcomes on, for these patients. Station 10. How can the NHS regulate online pharmacies to ensure patient safety and prevent misuse? So online pharmacies are getting very popular and what we mean by these pharmacies is that patients order their prescriptions online um, and they come in via their posts since they're dispensed by these online pres uh, prescribing platforms. And we, there's a lot of things that we can do to make sure that uh, we ensure patient safety and that there's no misuse going on. And we can do this by ensuring thorough ID checks, by monitoring prescriptions, ensuring that these um, platforms are licensed, they meet GDPR standards and that uh, we... and. We can also make sure that we educate patients on which pharmacies to use. So in terms of ID checks, we can make sure that um, these platforms have thorough double authentication pathways uh, to, make sure to make sure that the patients are getting the right prescriptions to prevent any misuse. Additionally, we can also monitor prescriptions by um, monitoring patient um, prescription histories um, to make sure that they're not getting the wrong medications or that they're not misusing any um, any particular medications either. Furthermore, we can also make sure that these platforms that are dispensing medications meet NHS standards. There needs to be strict licensing guidelines in place to make sure that they meet, um, that they match all of the pharmacies and they meet um, what the NHS requires of them. We can also actually educate our patients on identifying any fraudulent um, dispensing platforms and make sure that they understand how these platforms work and how their data is being used. And finally, um, we also need to make sure that these platforms, they are in line with the current GDPR standards to ensure that there's no data breaches and the patient's data is kept safely and securely on these platforms. So overall, although these are very convenient platforms, a lot of patients are using them and are using them successfully, we need to make sure that they are well regulated um, by the NHS to ensure that there's no misuse going on.